I'm Karen Milton. I'm the circuit executive for the Second Circuit. I want to welcome everyone to the Hands Lecture, which is named, as everyone hopefully knows, for the um, judges Learned and Augustus Hand, who sat for many decades on the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And today's lecture, as, as the other Hands Lectures um, have been sponsored, is sponsored by the Second Circuit Judicial Council Committee on History, Commemorative Events, and Civic Education. And this, the Hands Lectures are a series that have been started by the History Committee um, to present topics of interest to, that concern the Second Circuit, that concern our judges, our courthouses, our courts, or the third branch of government. And uh, we are very fortunate today to have Professor John Barrett with us to talk to us about Associate Justice Robert Jackson. But it is my great pleasure to introduce the Chief of Chiefs, Chief Judge Dennis Jacobs of the Second <laughs> Circuit. Well, welcome to this lecture in, in the series called Hands Lectures. Started a few years ago. The sponsor, as Karen Milton pointed out, is a Committee on History, Commemorative Events, and Civic Education of the Second Circuit Judicial Council. We're going to try to edit that uh, title down a little bit because it's, uh, it's a bit too much of a mouthful. But uh, it, it, the committee does all sorts of things. It's working on a book uh, that will contain uh, photographs of historic courthouses within the circuit, uh, and, uh, and, and, it, it, and it arranges um, uh, other events to commemorate the life of the courts, the judges, and the bar. Um, this particular event is underwritten by the Attorney Admissions Fee Fund of the Court of Appeals, which is uh, devoted uh, by statute to uh, endeavors that jointly benefit uh, the bench and bar. Uh, and the fund is overseen by two of my colleagues, Judge Robert A. Katzman and Judge Robert D. Sack, as well as our circuit executive, Karen Milton. The uh, lecture series is named for the Hands, Learned and Augustus, the famous cousins who served together on the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals into the 1950s. Because though they were cousins, they had contrasting personalities and views and expression and outlook they reflect a certain ideal, a, a court structure that is a family composed of judges with divergent spirits and a circuit of far-flung courts bound together in, in our common project. The idea of the Hands Lecture is to identify milestone events in the life of the courts of this circuit, to celebrate those events with lectures on related topics by distinguished speakers, and to take each occasion to honor members of the bar within our circuit who render service to our courts, lawyers who are officers of the courts uh, in more ways than one. As for the milestone, of course, we have now dedicated this new federal courthouse. It's a signal occasion, a great thing in the life of this community, the Western District of New York, and the Second Circuit. We are keenly aware that these events are auspic auspicious and historic especially since arrangements are far advanced for Congress to name this courthouse for Justice Robert Jackson, a great figure in American law who practiced in this community at one stage in his absolutely stellar career. To mark this occasion, we're, foremost, we're, ha we're fortunate to have the foremost authority on the life and work of Justice Jackson, Professor John Barrett of St. John's University School of Law. This lecture furnishes the considerable occasion for us to recognize the work of some distinguished members of the legal community. At this lecture and the reception to follow, we honor Gregory L. Peterson for his work preserving the historical legacy of Justice Jackson uh, in Buffalo and as a national figure. And we honor the lawyers who organized and implemented as well the, uh, this district's alternative dispute resolution program. First, Mr. Peterson is honored for his work at the Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York, and his inestimable assistance to the Western District in supporting the idea that this courthouse be named for Justice Jackson. When and as this happens, it will be the doing of Congressman Higgins and Senators Schumer and Gillibrand. But these things depend on initiative and support from the bar and individuals who care about our traditions. Mr. Peterson is a partner in the Phillips Lytle Law Firm one of the largest in this city. Second, this is the occasion for recognizing the work of lawyers and others 
who have made great contributions to justice through this district's ADR program. Six lawyers are receiving the district's Trailblazer Award for services on the ADR project program committee, which created this very successful program. It's, it's been implemented by a mediation panel, and this lecture is our opportunity to recognize 42 individuals, mostly lawyers, but some civilians as well, for their service to the mediation process. Professor Barrett is working on a biography of Justice Jackson that will have fair claim to be the authoritative work on the subject. Professor Barrett's email list furnishes to many of us early fruits of his research, vignettes, items of uh, correspondence, excerpts from memoirs, and insights that are generated by his deep and scholarly investigations. Every week or so, his emails tell us what Justice Jackson has been doing nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Barrett is the Elizabeth S. Lena Fellow at the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown. He grew up in Milwaukee, went to the Jesuit high school there, and was a championship debater, both in high school and in college, where he received national honors. He attended Georgetown University and Harvard Law School and clerked for Judge Leon Higginbotham of the Third Circuit Court of Appeal. It's an observed fact that uh, a biographer who has lavished years of research on one per person merges with the subject in a way. Their lives and endeavors come to align in a single track. And in this instance, it is a happy merger. Justice Jackson was a person of brilliance, wit, and great achievement. And Professor Barrett is a lively and scintillating speaker who simply seems to know everything about his subject. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Barrett. Thank you so much, Chief Judge Jacobs, for that introduction. And thank you, Judge Wesley, your colleague, and Chief Judge Scretney, the judges of the Western District, Circuit Executive Karen Milton, her colleagues, and all of you who are part of the honor I have to speak to you this morning. Um, thank you to the bench and the bar, the community and the citizenry of Buffalo and of the Western District of the Second Circuit. Uh, for this occasion of a courthouse dedication is really not simply a judicial or a court administrative or a legal profession accomplishment, but really it is what a district embodies. It is geography and the citizens who are here in this district, in this great circuit, that have this accomplishment to celebrate. And I really congratulate and thank each of you. My topic this morning is Robert H. Jackson and Buffalo in the Hands Circuit. And it contains the story of three rising arcs that I will discuss in sequence. First, the Western District of New York as a court. Second, the judge's hand, learned and Augustus hand, each first of the Southern District of New York and then of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And third, the arc of Justice Robert H. Jackson. Having climbed those arcs, if, if you will, uh, what I hope to explore is some of the intersections, some of the shared characteristics, some of the virtues and values, and some of the differences in the trajectories of those arcs and in, as they pertain to this majestic building, their enduring shine for us today. Now, the first arc is this court, not this building, this court, the Western District of New York. Article three of the Constitution, of course, gave us a Supreme Court and gave Congress the power to do more. And soon, Congresses and the President gave us circuits. And in time, the Eastern Circuit became the Second Circuit. The federal legislature and the President also gave us, in time, district courts. And in time, New York's two districts, the Southern and the Northern, each were cleaved. With the rise and growth of Brooklyn and Long Island, the Southern was joined by or reduced to adjacency to the Eastern District of New York. And with the rise and the growth of Western New York State, including Rochester, and especially the great leading American city of Buffalo, the Northern District in 1900 begat the Western District. I must acknowledge and thank Judge Curtin for his excellent lyrical history written in 1986 
of the story of this district, uh, which really uh, is a wonderful document. I have to thank Judge Kaplan for making it available to me, and it's really the shoulders on which I stand in telling parts of this story. A court is, of course, geography, and it is personnel. And beginning in 1900, the Western District was not a long, deep roster of personnel. This is a one-judge district at its birth. And that seat, tracing down through its successors, is today Judge Arcaris' seat. In 1928, a second judge was added to this district by statute, and in active service, that seat is today Judge Siragusa's seat. In 1967, the third seat was created, that is the Curtin seat, which is today occupied in active service by Chief Judge Scretney. And in 1987, the fourth seat in the Western District was created. That is formerly Judge Larimer's seat, but I was surprised and somewhat disappointed in the political process to discover while preparing for this lecture that it has not been occupied by a judge in active service since Judge Larimer took senior status in 2009. Now, I hasten to add that this district, like virtually every district I'm familiar with, has judges in senior service as a matter of status who are extremely active uh, fully laboring members of the work of the court. And thus, Judge Curtin, Judge Teleska, Judge Larimer, uh, having generously relinquished, relinquished, relinquished their active spots, if you will, uh, are fully part of the strength and the roster of this court today. Plus, this court has its statutory judges, um, a numerous and strong cohort, both the United States magistrate judges and the United States bankruptcy judges. And it has other federal functions and personnel, public services that comprise the entirety of the district. And it has, to circle back to where I began, geography. The Western District, of course, is the western side of New York State, vast, majestic New York State. As some of you know, I've told this story. Uh, when I began to work on Justice Jackson, I knew he was from upstate, and I knew he was from Jamestown. So I got out my AAA road atlas, and I ran my finger up the Hudson River looking for Jamestown because it, <laughs> because it was upstate. And I kept getting to Canada and not finding it, so I'd kind of go back down to Westchester and start over. Eventually, in the neighborhood of Cleveland, I found it. Uh, <laughs> by that 1900 statute, that created the Western District of New York, there are statutorily prescribed terms in locations in this vast district, all for that one judge, Judge Hazel, who was the first appointee to that position uh, in those early decades. Specifically, on the second Tuesdays in March and November, the statute prescribes that that judge of this district will preside here, will hold a term of court here in Buffalo. And on the second Tuesday in May, the judge of that district, that district will hold a term in Rochester. And on the second Tuesday in January, Elmira. And on the second Tuesday in October, Lockport. And my favorite discovery, on the second Tuesday in July, when I'll just happen to be there this year, Jamestown, by law, a term of the Western District Court. Now, in modern times, that statutory mandate has been shaped and limited. It's been limited by the creations of courthouses, which are, of course, fixed edifices. It's been affected by the appointments of additional judges and their chambers and sites being elsewhere in various ways. And it's been affected and, and sadly diminished by the tradition of pretermitting orders that suspends the term that by statute otherwise would occur in those various locations. But it does appear to me that by law, these judges have the power and full legal authority to saddle up and ride district if they become so inclined. <laughs> and I trust uh, that the clerk and the judges will keep me posted if those events are going to be scheduled soon. <laughs> that is the arc of the, the Western District of New York. The second arc I'd like to trace is the arc of the hands. They were, as Chief Judge Jacobs said, first cousins. Born first was Augustus Noble Hand. July 1869 in Elizabethtown, New York, which is up in the Adirondacks. And by the way, what a wonderful middle name, Noble, for a family to bequeath, but we're just getting started. The younger cousin, born a few years later in 1872 in Albany, is Billings' learned hand. He soon discarded his Billings, leaving him with the best judicial name in United States history, <laughs> Learned Hand. 
Only his dear friend and regular correspondent, Felix Frankfurter, uh, I think got away with or enjoyed using the billings, but in a compressed version. The letters, and they're voluminous between Hand and Frankfurter, between Cambridge and New York, and then between Washington and New York, are on Felix's side always addressed to B, dear B, which is the trace of billings. For the rest of us, for history, for the world, he was learned at hand. And he became a judge first in 1909, appointed by President Taft to the Southern District of New York. In 1914, he was joined on that court by Augustus, or Gus, appointed by President Wilson. In 1924, President Coolidge elevated, appointed learned to the Second Circuit. And in 1927, he was joined there by Gus. And it was a small circuit court. This is a court of two-thirds hands in that moment of their appointments. <laughs> and very soon, they were widely known leading national judges. This was due to many things, I think. Um, of course, their talents, I think, would be first on the list. They were extremely brilliant, prolific, uh, skilled writers, uh, just very good judicial officers. They also served in the central location of New York State. And the significance of New York in the first half of the 20th century particularly, and thus the Second Circuit as the court of last resort, the last mandatory jurisdiction in our court system, uh, in terms of commerce, in terms of government, in terms of law, in terms of life, cannot be overstated. And as the leading judges of that court, of course, the hands are national figures. Learned hand from the late 1920s forward, um, really well past the age where this conversation should have been continuing, was a perennial Supreme Court candidate. Um, I, I think Gus may get uh, a little bit less than his due in his time and historically, but for whatever reason, Learned was at the top of the short list and the mentions and the campaigns, but never quite called by the President and offered an appointment to the United States Supreme Court. Thus, each having reached the United States Court of Appeals, served there and concluded their service there after very lengthy periods of time. In 1953, Gus was the first to take senior status, and he passed away the next year at age 85 in 1954. In 1961, I, I'm sorry, Learned was the first to take senior status in 1951, then Gus in 1953. Gus passed away in 1954 at the age of 85, and Learned passed away in 1961 at the age of 89. Arc number three, Justice Robert H. Jackson. Uh, I will not keep you here for the rest of the day, but um, <laughs> welcome to my turf. Uh, Robert Jackson was born in 1892, uh, not in the Western District of New York. He was born in Pennsylvania, in northwestern Pennsylvania, in Warren County, in a township called Spring Creek, outside of a village called Spring Creek on a family farm that had been settled by his great-grandfather in 1801. He and another fellow migrating west from Connecticut, got as far as the Indian territories of Ohio and wars and stockade life drove them back a little bit. Uh, and they picked this beautiful valley and decided to build a log cabin and begin to clear trees there. And that man, Elijah Jackson, begat a son named Robert Rutherford Jackson, and he had a son named William Eldred Jackson. And by 1892, these are the decades across the 19th century, that fourth generation was Robert H. Jackson born on the family farm. His father was not cut out for farming. He was more of a 20th century man uh, in temperament. And as the century turned, his father moved the family across the New York state line to Frewsburg, a little village then and now. And that's where Robert Jackson grew up, where he attended the one room public school, where he had books and resources in the home, but not particularly uh, great economic power, where his father ran a hotel until it burned to the ground, and then a livery stable, and bought and sold horses, and raced horses, and bought and shipped lumber, and had a sawmill, and had the first automobile in Frewsburg, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, David Harum is a literary character. Uh, Harum Scarum is really the, the one trace that you may have heard of, the phrase Harum Scarum, which kind of means helter skelter. Uh, David Harum was a literary figure uh, in this time period, he was a wheeler dealer, if you will, and maybe a little bit on the shady side of the spectrum. Jackson's father was described by many, including him, as a David Harum character. Uh, Robert Jackson, for instance, remembered his first trip uh, to the big city. It was Pittsburgh. It was rafting with lumber that his father had bought and was shipping to sell. 
Uh, and a second trip took him there with his father to trade horses. Robert Jackson remembered watching his father do a horse trade and then saying to his father, you didn't even inspect the horse that you just got. And his father patted his boy on the head, as I imagine it, and said, sometimes all you need to know is what you're trading away. <laughs> Robert Jackson graduated from the Frewsburg High School in 1909, when he was 17 years old. The Frewsburg High School had a very small class, so he was the valedictorian, but that wasn't a huge accomplishment. It had a number of teachers who had some higher education, but I believe none was a university graduate. For the next year, Jackson sought intellectual riches that were not available in his Frewsburg. He commuted by trolley up the valley the Warren to Jamestown Valley, the Warren to Jamestown trolley line, to attend the Jamestown High School as a postgraduate student, as a second year, second senior year high school student, if you will, the year he turned 17 and 18. And at that school, he got university educated, uh, quite brilliant teachers who tutored him in the things that really emerge across the rest of his life, economics, English literature, American literature, history, politics, etc. And it seems that there was almost a tutorial model. They designed a curriculum for him and took such a shine to him that they began to spare him the trolley ride home. And he bunked in with the principal and with an elderly woman who was the English teacher and with others. Um, and this Jamestown environment was his intellectual hothouse. I pause on it because that was his last year of general higher education. Graduating from the Jamestown High School in 1910, Jackson never went on to attend a single day of college in his life. Um, he was a very learned man, and he'd had these teaching resources, if you will. But from this point forward, as a general matter, he was self-taught. At 18, he stays in Jamestown, and he becomes an apprentice to a two-man law office, a classic two-man law office. One is a politico, a trial lawyer, a talker, a wheeler dealer, distantly related to Jackson's mother by a grandmother's late-life marriage. And this fellow was, um, you know, the sort of public actor, the podium, the jury, the court, um, the politics, Jackson, as, an, as a forebearer. The other fellow was deeply scholarly, uh, university educated, sophisticated law school, um, a, a big writer, a big reader, a former journalist, a student of the classics, a speaker of many languages, and that was the other half of the practice. Basically, this was the brief writer and this was the courtroom talker, and together, they shaped and tutored and poured each of their sets of talents into this boy Jackson who turned out to have both of them. The second fellow, Benjamin Dean was his name, uh, encouraged Jackson to seek a year or so of law school training, not to simply become a lawyer by reading the law through apprenticeship. And so with Dean's influence, Jackson picks the Albany Law School and goes there for a year, 1911, 1912. This is the centennial. Um, for a number of reasons. He considers Buffalo. Um, Buffalo is huge, Buffalo is nearby. Many of the leading lights in Jamestown, including the first lawyer, are UB graduates. Uh, the Buffalo College of Law is what it was called at the time. Um, and he considers that. He also considers New York City, but the city, the big city, uh, doesn't particularly attract him. It's not much bigger than Buffalo or much more important, but it's a lot further away. But between the two uh, is Albany. And it's Albany as a seat of government and a site of courts, in addition to a home of a law school, that attracts Jackson. Plus, maybe there's a little bit of his father in this. Albany Law School in that year, 1911-1912, is in its final year of holding a two-year program. Beginning the next year, it's going to expand to a three-year program. And it's not going to give credit the way it had previously for apprenticeship. Jackson gets in in the last class where he can get full credit for apprenticing for a year, in effect transferring in as a senior to the second year class, and earns enormously high grades and finishes very near the top of his class, perhaps not number one, but it's a large class of some who go on to great legal careers. Um, and he's still only 20 years old. The New York bar at that point required you to be 21 before you could take the bar exam and join the roles of the lawyers of this state. And so Jackson returns to Jamestown and apprentices for that additional year. And then in 1913, at age 21, he becomes a lawyer. For the next 20 years, his footprint and practice is Jamestown, Chautauqua County, Albany, and New York State. 
and he rises to enormous heights. He's, as we heard yesterday from Chief Judge Scretney, a member of the bar of this court. He's very active uh, locally, regionally, and ultimately nationally in bar associations. President of the Jamestown Bar, second president of the Federation of the Bars of Western New York State. Eventually, by 1933, the elected chair of the American Bar Association House of Delegates. The path, after 20 years of private practice, takes him into politics and national service in Washington. Uh, he had met Franklin Roosevelt as a young man, 1911. Jackson was 18, Franklin Roosevelt was a 28-year-old freshman state senator. And a handshake, an anonymous, forgettable event, uh, becomes a political contact which over the Wilson years ripens into a little bit of a patronage relationship. And then after Roosevelt's return from polio and his gubernatorial run in 1928 becomes really a significant affiliation. Jackson is a legal power in Western New York State and a Democrat. And Roosevelt, of course, is elected in 28 and reelected in 30 and White House bound in 32. Jackson never takes a full-time appointment in Albany, but he's very much a speech writer and a proxy speaker and a consultant and appointed to various positions um, that are temporary uh, service positions in state government. And then Washington. Jackson's path in Washington is meteoric. Uh, I will only tick off the path. He is appointed by Roosevelt and confirmed by the Senate in 1934 to be the Assistant General Counsel heading the Bureau of Revenue in the Department of the Treasury. Today it's the General Counsel of the IRS. At that time, that office of 200 lawyers was the biggest law firm in human history. It dwarfed the Department of Justice and every firm in the private sector. And Jackson is the Chief Counsel heading that firm. Now he has no temperament for administration and quickly realizes he has a very strong deputy and thus hands off all of that to his deputy and begins to handle very high profile cases. The biggest of which is the federal tax prosecution, civilly, of Andrew W. Mellon, Secretary Mellon of Harding Coolidge Hoover administrations, Mellon of Mellon Bank, Mellon of Pittsburgh, Mellon of serious tax problems and a deficiency judgment uh, in 1933 and very lawyered up and willing to fight to the death. Mellon hires Frank Hogan of Hogan and Hartson, soon to be president of the American Bar Association, and Franklin Roosevelt and Henry Morgenthau and Herman Oliphant, the sort of legal powers in the chain above the Revenue Bureau, have Robert Jackson. He goes to Pittsburgh, and this is America's headline case, 1935. It's a pitched battle. Jackson cross-examines Mellon. Mellon weeps on the stand. Um, the Board of Tax Appeals largely appointed by former Secretary Mellon, actually, um, ultimately upholds the deficiency judgment. And it's about $400,000, which is real money in 1935-36. And it's very complicated. Uh, but a portion of it is accessible. Um, I know other parts of this courthouse have uh, the portraits that were in the lovely pamphlet yesterday of some of the leading uh, senior status and former judges of this court. Um, and the building is a work of art, and the lobby, of course, has a work of art. Andrew Mellon was a man of art. He had a tremendous collection of art. And he had, for tax benefits, donated it to various philanthropies in the 1920s. But somehow the art had never moved. It continued to be on the walls in Fifth <laughs> Avenue and in Pittsburgh <laughs> and so forth. And that was a bit of the IRS or the Revenue Bureau trouble with Andrew W. Mellon and his accountants, to be fair to Mr. Mellon. Um, now, Coincidentally, the trial of 1935 and the judgment and some appellate proceedings of 1936 are followed by a spontaneous gesture by Mr. Mellon in January of 1937. Uh, in his elderly years, nearing the end of his time, with the great resources and deep love of country that he had, he spontaneously contacts President Roosevelt and donates to the United States his vast personal art collection. And somehow the tax case also is wrapped up shortly thereafter. <laughs> and the Mellon collection is the backbone of the National Gallery of Art on the Mall, which is then built in 1938, 39, 1940. And it's dedicated in 1941 with the President and the Cabinet, Mr. Mellon has passed on by then, in attendance. And the Attorney General of the United States is Robert H. Jackson. And there aren't perfect photos but there must have been a moment or two when a smirk was on his face. I haven't quite found that photo. I have found the documents where Franklin Roosevelt privately refers to that 
wonderful treasure of our country as Bob's Museum. <laughs> now from the Revenue Bureau, in those first two years, Jackson goes over to the SEC temporarily for very high stakes litigation. He's defending with colleagues the constitutionality of the Public Utility Holding Company Act, a major New Deal law. It's a counterpart, really, to the Affordable Care Act and today's litigation. Big questions of national power, uh, big, uh, very well-represented uh, litigants challenging the constitutionality. The PUCA case sort of travels a path, and ultimately the statute is upheld a few years later. But Jackson's in the trial courts in 1936 under the umbrella of the SEC beginning that defense work. And then he goes over to the Justice Department. In 1936, he is appointed, again confirmed by the Senate, as the Assistant Attorney General heading the Tax Division. A year later, he's transferred over to head the Antitrust Division. A year after that, he's appointed and again confirmed, and this was the one confirmation battle that was an absolute blood war, to be Solicitor General of the United States. Very pitched confirmation battle. And basically the issue is, you are a radical New Dealer and you're destined to be President of the United States. So we who oppose that are going to stop you right here, right now. You're not going to be Solicitor General. Um, he gets 62 votes and he becomes Solicitor General. And before a Supreme Court that has admittedly changed, turned, begun to have Roosevelt appointees, in the next two years he argues over 40 cases, wins almost all of them. Uh, and is such a brilliant advocate that Justice Brandeis says Jackson should be Solicitor General for life. It's the job that Jackson, uh, the domestic job that Jackson loved most and thought was the dream job of every lawyer. Nothing better than being Solicitor General of the United States. Um, intellectual feast, high responsibility, autonomy, advocacy, etc. Uh, but duty called and in 1940 the President elevates him, SG then was the number two job in the Department of Justice, to be the Attorney General. And after 18 months in that position, during years of war preparation and some very tricky legal navigation between neutrality statutes to provide assistance to Great Britain as it stood alone against Hitler, uh, Jackson is appointed in the summer of 1941 to the Supreme Court of the United States. He serves there for 13 years. He's known for his brilliant pen. That's what first grabbed me and I think first grabs a lot of people when you read Jackson's opinions. Um, he's better than almost every other writer who ever served on the court. And there's a visible person authoring these opinions. And there's candor about the considerations and the weighing and the dilemmas and the compromises that's involved in a kind of pragmatic bottom line that he reaches. And what he reaches, as you look across his bottom lines, doesn't all fit in one pigeonhole. Um, yes, national power interpreted um, expansively is a generation that he's part of, and yes, civil liberties generally interpreted expansively, but not lockstep, not reflexive, not entirely consistent, not without thinking through a case at a time, which is a hallmark, I think, of a lawyer becoming a judge. Those 13 years had one interruption. During 1945, 1946, Robert Jackson failed to show up for work at the Supreme Court of the United States. Because President Harry Truman in the spring of 1945 knew President Harry Truman, inheriting these enormous responsibilities that he wasn't prepared for, has to deliver on the Allied commitment to prosecute the senior Nazis after their defeat as war criminals. He gets Jackson, because Jackson is America's best lawyer and Truman knew him and revered him, and asked Jackson to, to leave the court. Now the timing is interesting. It's April of 1945 when this approach is made. And Jackson's told, uh, Germany's about to be defeated. Hitler is about to be captured. The international plan is all worked out you know, across Yalta, Cairo, Tehran, etc. cetera. Um, the evidence is all assembled. And you, as a fast, autonomous writer, are already done with your opinions for this term. And you have a summer recess. You're everything we want, and you're totally available to be everything we need. And you can be back on the court the first Monday of October, 1945. Now, I think as a general matter, when our president asks any of us, the right answer is yes. Uh, and that was Jackson's reflex. But in addition, certainly this pitch was an attractive one. No sooner does he take the job than it all turns to dust. Uh, Hitler, of course, and other senior Nazis uh, do not remain on the scene. There is no evidence assembled. There is no international plan. Uh, there is no staff, no uh, operation to head. Uh, 
And so it becomes a year, not a summer, a year. He misses an entire term of the Supreme Court, but he does Nuremberg as the chief American prosecutor. And we will return to that topic. Now, in that Jacksonian arc, I've left something out. And that, of course, is Buffalo. And what's been interesting to me in my own work and interesting in, I think, those of you who share the work and the interest with me and in the service of Western New York, bench, bar, citizenry, et cetera, is the dawning understanding of the big Buffalo part that was Robert Jackson's life. In 1916 or 1917, that young lawyer Jackson, admitted to the bar in 1913, so he's now you know, about 25 years old, is litigating in the county courthouse of Chautauqua County, Mayville, New York, north end of Chautauqua Lake. The justice of the New York State Supreme Court who's holding term there is Charles B. Sears, a great legal name and life of this community. Charles Sears is newly appointed to the New York Supreme Court and soon elected and then begins his decades of distinguished service which end up on the New York Court of Appeals. And Charles Sears sees this young lawyer who knocks his socks off, um, litigates beautifully and in the sort of social milieu of the time with judges and lawyers sharing rooming houses and talking after hours when court is done. It's almost John Marshall-esque the way things still worked in this period. He gets to know this boy and he finds that he's deeply knowledgeable about all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't expect some rube from Chautauqua County to know about. <laughs> and to go to the bench, Charles Sears has left one of Buffalo's leading law firms. And he knows that his former partners are looking for a trial man. And what Sears brokers is the recruitment of Jackson to Buffalo. The firm is called Penny, Killeen, and Nye. Thomas Penny had been Erie County's district attorney. He had prosecuted the assassin of President William McKinley here in 1901. And then I think uh, in an admirable way as I've dug into him, not wanting to sort of trade on that celebrity, left public service to be a routine lawyer and sort of receded into the profession in a very modest way, but a very powerful, skilled way. His firm, and the two other partners were also quite excellent lawyers it appears, had one principal client, the International Railway Corporation, the IRC, Buffalo's streetcar company. And that meant they had a lot of tort defense work, uh, streetcars injuring people who sued. And their trial men, yes, sadly it was a world of all male lawyers, uh, at least in this firm and pretty much across the profession, uh, was very high volume. And Jackson is recruited to get that experience in the Fourth Department, in the State Supreme Court, a little bit in the Federal Court. The office of Penny, Killeen, and Nye then was on the eighth floor of the Ellicott Square building. When built in the late 19th century, it was the world's biggest office building. It had been eclipsed a little bit earlier than Jackson's time, but luckily it stands today and it is a treasure, just a marvel. And on the eighth floor, there's a title insurance company with a very generous chairman uh, who has welcomed me into Jackson's office space and some of the old woodwork um, is still there up on the eighth floor. The law library on nine and 10 is gone and the restaurants and clubs are largely gone, uh, but you get the feel of Ellicott Square. And for about two years, Jackson is practicing law out of that office and on a daily basis, high volume in the courts of Buffalo. And he's living, of course, nearby. Um, right out that door, and out that window looking north, if the building only had 20 more stories, Chief Judge Scranton, <laughs> Chief Judge Arcara, um, one would be able to see down Elmwood and see over the Hutchinson Technical High School and see a beautiful little pocket park, park called Johnson Park. It was Mr. Johnson's home originally in the 19th century and it was twice as long. Eventually it was cut in half and Elmwood was put through and the IRC put a trolley line, a streetcar line, down Elmwood. Um, and it turned from a mansion neighborhood into a neighborhood with some apartment houses. And Robert Jackson and his wife of a year, Irene Jackson, rent and live in an apartment in 49 Johnson Park, the Lind Haven apartment building, which stands to this day on the corner of Elmwood and Johnson Park North. Um, I wouldn't call it the most dazzling apartment building I've ever seen. <laughs> Uh, but he wasn't anything special, right? He was a young, uh, hardworking, brilliant, but rising Buffalo lawyer. And in the context of where we are and this event, here's the last thing that's very striking. To get from there to there, 
comes right by here. <laughs> to get from Johnson Park to Ellicott Square is a walk into Niagara Square and then a left. Uh, and if the weather was bad or you were in a hurry, it's a streetcar ride on the IRC. I imagine Jackson had some sort of a pass, free rides as lawyer for the IRC. Uh, so I don't know how much walking versus riding he did. But his footprints left metaphorically grooves literally on the spot where this courthouse stands. After about two years, 1917, 1918, the Jacksons decide to return to Jamestown. Many factors are involved. One is a job offer. The mayor has asked Jackson to become acting corporation counsel because the incumbent has been called into a federal government war-related job. Another factor is that Irene is pregnant, expecting their first child, and really, they don't know anybody in Buffalo. She's not from Jamestown, but there's at least Jackson family in that region, uh, and I think that's a factor. Fall of 1918 is influenza, big, devastating horrible influenza, and it seems worse the bigger the city. And you see pictures of the bodies on the curbs in Buffalo in September of 1918, which is about the time that Jackson and Irene are deciding to retreat to the south. And finally, Jackson has made a decision, which is, I think, part of the, the vision that one can spot at lots of points in his life. He's very ambitious. He wants to rise. He wants to succeed. He wants opportunities. And he concludes that Buffalo is big. That's not hard, Sherlock. He concludes that it's harder to emerge quickly in the bigger place. That he's learned a lot, that he's developed a lot, but that he can take that to a smaller stage and pretty quickly have a floodlight stage front row role there. And that's what he does in Chautauqua County. And he is absolutely right. In 1919, he argues his first case before the New York Court of Appeals. Judge Cardozo in the tradition of Judge Sears, immediately takes a shine to this young advocate. The Bar Federation sequence that I've described begins to take shape. In 1930, Cardozo nominates Jackson for election to the membership of the American Law Institute. And now you're making the big time, and he's still a very young man. And the ALI Council says at this proposed membership discussion, Robert H. Jackstown, Jackson, Jamestown, New York, who's he? I've never heard of him. And Cardozo, vice president of the ALI, in his very quiet way says, oh, you will. <laughs> in 1933, the ABA House of Delegates is his elected position, uh, and the FDR campaigns, and et cetera, and 1934 in Washington. Now, part two, those were the arcs. Now let's talk about some intersections. First, the hands in the Western District of New York. I must say, there are innumerable cases that are, of course, Western District cases, Buffalo cases that become Second Circuit cases that are the work of the hands during their judicial careers. But to my dismay, so far, I am unable to find any evidence that either one of them ever set foot in the Western District of New York. I hope that's wrong and I put it out as a group challenge, but a hand footprint or a groove or a path here um, is still something to be found. A second category is much, much easier, Jackson and the Western District. You know, I've already told you the early part, it's easy. He lived here, he was here, he lawyered here, he became deeply connected here. But beyond that, even when he left, back to Jamestown and then to Washington, he was from here, Western New York always, and he returned constantly. Part of it was the deep ties he had to Buffalo friends, including lawyers, Charles B. Sears, John Lord O'Brien, William J. Donovan, David Diamond, et cetera, et cetera. The generation of legal talent, civic leadership, luminaries who were peers uh, in this big city are Jackson's people. Then and later, they stayed and they emerged in the bigger stage. Jackson found another path and emerged elsewhere. The bar associations, the ABA meeting here for its annual meeting in 1927. The Erie County Bar Association in 1942 having a special session across the street at the Statler in the Grand Ballroom to fet and hear from Western New York's now Supreme Court Justice, Robert H. Jackson. The cases as a lawyer and then as a judge that were Western New York cases that connected Jackson to this place. The University of Buffalo, where his personal ties included close friendships with Francis Shea, the dean, who he then lured to Washington to head the civil division in DOJ and then Frank Shea stayed there. Nuremberg and then Shea and Gardner was the rest of his career. And Brandeis scolded Jackson 
for stealing such a fine lawyer from a community which needed him, Buffalo, New York. Louis Jaffe, another Jackson, Washington colleague who became a professor and dean at UB Law School. The 1942 UB commencement has Jackson as its speaker. The 1946 UB centennial is built around Jackson's schedule. And he is the closing ceremony speaker at Kleinhans Music Hall. He is awarded UB's first honorary degree. They break their tradition of no honorary degrees after 100 years to begin giving them in 1946 to Jackson. And the occasion, October 4, 1946, is Jackson, through grueling legs of different forms of transportation, traveling back from Nuremberg, racing to make it back for the first Monday in October 1946, by way of Buffalo, where he is committed to give this centennial speech and to receive this degree and to explain here first what Nuremberg had been all about. 1951, the inaugural Mitchell Lecture at the University of Buffalo Law School, uh, enduring speech by Jackson about civil liberties in wartime and the balances and trade-offs and dilemmas as we wrestle with those challenges. The judges of the Western District of New York, Jackson knew them all. Those of his lifetime were his people. Uh, two that I'll flag, Judge Harlan Rippey was in a funny way the sort of intersecting alternative path of Jackson's early career. You see, in 1934, Judge Rippey was appointed to this court. Jackson passed on that appointment. Federal service on the bench was something that he wasn't quite sure he wanted or was ready for, and the call to Washington and Treasury and revenue is what he took instead. And what's in the background in 1934 for Jackson is nomination and then election to the New York Court of Appeals. It doesn't quite work out that way because of cross-nomination and bipartisanship, a wonderful thing. And so Jackson isn't standing for election to the New York Court of Appeals, the court he really wanted. Cardozo, of course, told him and others, that's a real court. That's the court you should be on, Judge Wesley. <laughs> with, with apologies, uh, moving on is also a wonderful tradition. <laughs> Uh, I sometimes ask and after 1934 and the Court of Appeals, the New York Court of Appeals not happening for Jackson and his federal service continuing, interestingly it happens in 1936 for Judge Rippey, who leaves this court, the Western District, after only a two-year tenure to serve for a much longer span of time on the New York Court of Appeals. Um, I guess that's in a way called a, an inverse Wesley. Um, <laughs> that's one colleague, if you will. The second is just a moment, but it's the day when I can tell you that Jackson served, literally sat on the bench in the Western District of New York. June 28, 1944. Alas, it happened in Rochester, not here in Buffalo. And it was a two-judge panel, Judge Harold Burke and Justice Robert Jackson sitting by some sort of designation, um, you know, judicial judge, uh, district judge ledger domain, I think is probably the category. And here was the court business. It was the admission to the bar of Jackson's son. Oh. And instead of Judge Burke doing it solo, he had the proud father, Donna Robe, and sit next to him. And together, they admitted William E. Jackson, who became one of New York City's leading lawyers, the chairman of Milbank Tweed, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to the bar of the Western District of New York. And finally, in terms of intersections, Robert H. Jackson became the Second Circuit Justice when he was a Supreme Court Justice, and thus, the Western District's Circuit Justice. A third group of intersections, Jackson and the Hands. They, of course, Learned and Gus, were large figures already ahead of Jackson. They are older, and he's still rising when they are the judge's hand, first of the trial court and then of the United States Court of Appeals. Of course, therefore, he knew of them. He studied them. He used their judicial work in his lawyering. I suspect he first met them in the early 1930s in a handshake sort of way when they were together as members of the ALI, the hands as luminaries and Jackson of Jamestown, New York as a new elected member. Um, then Jackson begins to serve in the federal government and in his SEC and DOJ years he litigates cases in the Second Circuit including before the judge's hand, including one aspect of the public utility holding company defense of the late 1930s. He begins as Solicitor General to have a lot of administrative responsibilities in the Department of Justice. Uh, 
and that includes judicial appointment matters. So the correspondence trail begins with Jackson and Learned Hand, then the chief of the Second Circuit, corresponding quite regularly about vacancies and appointments and all the administrative delights that come with the chief's cap. There also was a, a sad episode that I'll touch on only briefly because I have a wonderful quote from Learned Hand. A judge of the Second Circuit, Martin Manton, turned out to be a deep criminal. Uh, and he was detected really by state district attorney Tom Dewey in the Manhattan DA's office, but there wasn't really um, state law crime that could be prosecuted. And so Dewey does an impeachment report and John Cahill picks it up as a federal investigation and it becomes a prosecution of a sitting judge of the Second Circuit and his conviction and his incarceration. The Manton case is a nightmare for the judiciary and for the Department of Justice. And Learned Hand and Robert Jackson have extensive dealings about the, Mar the Manton case, um, the special appellate panel that needs to hear Judge Manton's appeal because, of course, the Second Circuit is recused, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Learned Hand, who sat for many years with Martin Manton, in cases where Martin Manton was convicted of selling his vote, was called as a defense witness and had the horrible experience of testifying that he never saw anything indicating that his colleague was dirty. And here's Judge Hand's very terse description of all of this in 1951 while testifying before a Senate subcommittee. There linger in the back of my memory some things that happened very close at home, but they shall not be mentioned. In private, that was a Jackson Hand topic, Learned Hand, Robert Jackson topic, for a couple of decades. Then Jackson becomes a Supreme Court Justice and the Second Circuit Justice and the administrative responsibilities and interactions of the Circuit Justice and the Chief Judge uh, are considerable. For example, a Northern District of New York judge was paralyzed by the responsibilities of the job but would not resign. And there's a lot of back and forth between Learned Hand, the Chief, and Robert Jackson, the Circuit Justice, about what to do with that problem. There are also, of course, cases. Cases now flowing from the Second Circuit to the Supreme Court on which Jackson sits. Jackson had deep admiration for both judges' hand. Um, in Jackson's opinions, it's conspicuous. Um, there are two things one can observe. He's not a gratuitous quoter or mentioner of people. Uh, he doesn't reach for a lot of judicial or literary or historical figures as a general matter, but he does have a bit of a habit of mentioning the hands by name and quoting them. A former Jackson law clerk, Jim Marsh, who I got to know, a wonderful Philadelphia lawyer, remembered Jackson during the clerkship of Marsh, 1947, 1948, talking with him about Second Circuit cases and where people were you know, appealing and there was a hand opinion. And Jackson often saying, you know, I would just love to sit down with the old man and talk about this because what he wrote and what he taught and what he decided is really a role model for me. A particular case I want to flag is United States versus DeRay. It's not an enduring landmark. It's a Fourth Amendment case about search incident to arrest in a car, search of a passenger. And the law has somewhat moved on past DeRay. It was a case in Buffalo. The bust occurred. The surveillance was tracking the driver and the front seat passenger. The crime being investigated was black market rationing coupon trading during the war years. And the bust found evidence on those two fellows. And in the back seat is Mr. DeRay, who's also arrested. An incident to his arrest, he's searched, and coupons are found on DeRay, too. The surveillance, nobody knew anything about DeRay. Seems to be a dubious character, we later learn. But he was an, an accident on the scene. And the front seat probable cause is construed first by the prosecutor and then in the trial as justifying the search and the gathering of the evidence and the conviction of Mr. DeRay, who appeals. One beautiful thing about the Western District and the DeRay case is they obeyed the law. They tried the case in Jamestown that summer of 1944. It's a Buffalo case. I don't know why it was tried in Jamestown, but they were holding that term pursuant to the statutory mandate, which leads to some sort of snide comments when Jackson writes the Supreme Court opinion in the DeRay case. The Second Circuit, you see, reverses the conviction. And Learned Hand writes the opinion, vindicating Mr. DeRay's Fourth Amendment claim. And then it comes to the Supreme Court on the government cert petition. 
And Jackson's law clerk, Murray Gartner, a brilliant New York City lawyer, recently departed, former president of the Harvard Law Review, one of the smartest and lovely guys you could ever meet, writes Jackson a cert memo, saying with all the confidence of his youth, Judge Hand's opinion is clearly wrong. And that's Murray Gartner's phrase to Jackson. Well, the Supreme Court disagreed. Robert Jackson wrote the opinion. It's quite in the track that Learned Hand had set forth in his opinion. And I think it's a part of that emulation that's sort of inverted when one thinks of their ranks. This is a Supreme Court justice emulating, following, admiring, tracking a circuit judge. One other case, United States versus Dennis. The Dennis case, you may remember, is a huge cause celeb. It is the federal prosecution under the Smith Act of the leadership of the American Communist Party, CPUSA, in the late 1940s. It's a trial in the Southern District in Foley Square held before Judge Harold Medina. It takes a year and it is a circus trial of all kinds of obstreperous, disruptive behavior by the defense attorneys, ultimately convictions, and then Judge Medina sua sponte holding all the defense attorneys in criminal contempt, which becomes United States versus Satcher as he sends them all to prison. Both of those cases traveled to the Supreme Court in the depths of the Cold War. There is, I'm delighted to report, absolutely no truth to any allegation that Chief Judge Jacob's parents named him Dennis <laughs> after Eugene Dennis, <laughs> the lead defendant in that case. I've been delighted to learn from an authoritative source that the chief was no red diaper baby and that his father was on the merchant side of the American economy, etc. Um, it is a tough case. It is a complicated case. It is a case in a climate. And it's a case that a lot of modern views consider quite dubious in the context of the First Amendment as we view it today. Because this is an ideas case. This is an expression case. This is very abstract advocacy. Yes, of course, the destination of communism would be the overthrow of the American government. But Eugene Dennis and Gus Hall and the co-defendants were not on the brink of accomplishing that. And their overt acts actually in pursuit of that sort of stop at what looks quite a bit like traditional speech. In the Second Circuit, the Dennis, opin the Dennis conviction, the group of convictions, is affirmed, two to one, opinion by learned hand. Um, an agonizing opinion, long and tortured and visible in its wrestling with the dilemmas. And similarly, the Supreme Court's affirmance of the convictions, including Robert Jackson's opinion, is agonizing. It's a concurring opinion. It's a clear and present danger test uniquely applied to communism and saying that kind of as a category, it meets the test of incitement and thus is beyond the First Amendment. Um, and there's no paper trail showing any later discussion of it. But there is an event that follows shortly thereafter, and it follows learned hand taking senior status, that I view as in the climate of the Dennis case and this tough judging, which isn't about coming out here or here, it's about exercising the weighty, weighty responsibility. In December of 1951, the New York County Lawyers Association holds a tribute dinner for the cousin's hand. It's at the Waldorf. There are over 1,000 people present. Um, the Attorney General of the United States is the principal speaker, and many luminaries are there. And Robert Jackson, the Circuit Justice, gives an after-dinner toast, brief remarks. He calls it kind of a devil's advocate speech. It includes the line that has become quite infamous, and I think may well be one that Jackson coined, although maybe it was being mumbled about and he just published it first. He said, if I were trying to, he's going through various ways to rank the hands, why are they great? And he says, it's not because they decide cases right. Uh, you know, what does it mean? It's not because this or that. Uh, it's because of how they work at the difficult work of the law. And then he says, indeed, if I were trying to formulate a recipe to be a perfect district court judge, I can capture it in a simple phrase. Quote learned, follow Gus. <laughs> now in the background, I've found a lovely letter from John Lloyd O'Brien, Jackson intimate Buffalo lawyer, to Felix Frankfurter, describing how Gus Hand worked diligently not to be quotable. He'd go back over his opinions again and again and strike out anything that he thought was going to be sort of excised because he thought the entirety of the work product was the point, not some selective quotation. And after Jackson spoke at that dinner, um, Gus, who's a much less prolific correspondent and thus leaves less of a trail and is less of a personality, 
writes a lovely letter to Jackson uh, from his apartment off Central Park, his home address. He writes to Jackson to thank him for his tribute remarks. And he says, and as to your lovely line about Learn It, I must tell you, it was Mrs. Hand's favorite part of the entire evening. <laughs> Mrs. Augustus Hand, of course. Maybe Mrs. Learn It, too. Um, I have handout copies, which I will give you later. If you haven't read that address, it's a lovely speech. Um, so those are our intersections. Let's conclude by turning towards some comparisons and assessments that seem relevant in thinking about these men, this service, and this building. Um, first, I'd like to give you a glimpse of the controversy about Jackson and Nuremberg. And Nuremberg as legal building, not edifice building, institution building, law building. Jackson died of a heart attack in October 1954, October 9, 1954. And nine days later, after the funeral and burial in Frewsburg and the justices traveling and then returning, Learned Hand at Foley Square writes a letter to his intimate friend, Felix Frankfurter, who had been Jackson's closest colleague and friend on the court for the entirety of Jackson's judicial service. And this is Learned Hand's letter. I have had it in mind for some time to write to you about Jackson's death knowing that it would make a great difference to you. He was to me an unusually agreeable creature, vital, brave, devoid of sham, and able and willing to unmask it wherever he found it. He had a particularly fre fresh and pungent way of writing and a much broader outlook than is the common achievement of our profession. On the other hand, I felt so strongly about the illegitimacy of the whole Nuremberg episode, I don't mean because Jackson was on the Supreme Court, that there was a time when it was actually repellent to me to see him. He had associated himself with a step backward towards savagery, covering it with high sounding appeals to progress. But quite consistent with that, what I've just said about him, isn't it? I have never changed my view about that. Rather, I have become more convinced that I was right. However, you know how it is. Those immediate emotions pale with time, thank God, so that I came to like his company and to have something akin a little akin to affection for him. What Learned Hand privately, very pungently, is giving voice to is, in its time, the controversy about Nuremberg. Nuremberg is, of course, explicitly and visibly the invention of a new institution. It is the creation after the war of a new court before which to adjudicate the guilt of these Nazi arch criminals. And it's Jackson's creation. And beyond the institution, it is the codification for the first time of a body of law never previously codified. Crimes against humanity, uh, waging aggressive war, conspiracy to commit each of those. And the cry of ex post facto, of victor's justice, of rigged proceeding was a serious domestic critique um, as Jackson was doing it. It's striking how few Americans beyond the Jackson team had nice things to say about Nuremberg. Learned Hand is speaking for an American bar majority, even into the 1950s. And of course, we did Nuremberg with the Soviets, the bad guys of the Cold War that begins at Nuremberg, among other places, immediately after the war. And Learned Hand, as expressed in this letter, is that personality, is that critic, is that doubter, is that pessimist. And I juxtapose that with Jackson. In 1951, the Truman administration was rife with scandals. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation particularly, the Attorney General of the United States is fired, uh, many prosecutions, over 140 executive branch senior officials are involved in corruption messes. In response to this, Senator Paul Douglas of Illinois, a young reform Democrat, gets the idea to hold extensive public hearings on ethics and government. He's considering whether to create a commission on ethics to draft some kind of code of conduct for people serving in government. The Senate subcommittee, uh, part of the Committee on Labor and Public Welfare, holds 15 public sessions covered thoroughly in the press in the summer of 1951. Now, locate this in time. This is the year after Dennis, and this is a few, years a few months before the December 1951 Waldorf Astoria tribute dinner to the hands. That's the summer of 1951. Many expert witnesses from public and private life are called, including philosophy professor Theodore Green from Yale, Dean Appleby of Syracuse's Maxwell School, the editor of the Christian Science Monitor, 
the president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the president of the US Chamber of Commerce, a leader of the National Farmers Union, the national chairman of the American Veterans Committee, the chairman of the NAACP, current and former members of Congress, current and former executive branch officials, to talk about you know, what's wrong with us and how do we become an ethical government. And Judge Learned Hand, age 79, and Justice Robert H. Jackson, age 59, 10 years of justice, five years post Nuremberg. In his testimony, these are some pieces of learned hand. I do not know how to measure values, he testified, how to measure morals of all sorts. My own heroes in the past have been people who were not anxious and who did not know how to select abstract generalizations, which they thought valid for situations. They were very largely compromisers. He listed his heroes. They included Erasmus and George Saville, Robert Walpole, Oliver Cromwell. And then, in a very striking phrase, he said, Cromwell's line stays with me. He wrote in 1650 to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, the Kirk, before what Cromwell was hoping to avoid, but in the end was not avoided, the Battle of Dunbar, in which the British defeated the Scots. This is the Third Civil War of Britain. Cromwell writes, I beseech ye in the bowels of Christ, think that ye may be mistaken. Learned Hand's favorite quote. And then he went on to testify. He testified in this 1951 Paul Douglas hearing about the matter at hand, people, behavior, government, modern US government. And he said, I should like that written over the portal of every church, every school, and every courthouse. May I say, I should even add over the portal of every legislative room in the United States. I should like every court to begin, I'm not sure where Mike Romer is, he could do this beautifully. <laughs> I should like every court to begin. I beseech ye in the bowels of Christ, think that ye may be mistaken. <laughs> we'll put the establishment clause to one side. Um, <laughs> It's a message that Learned Hand is asking to be aimed at him, really, more than the litigants or the citizenry. Uh, it is deep doubt about the judicial enterprise. It is depressive thinking. Later, near the end of the testimony, Senator Douglas asked Hand if law or anything can improve the ethical situation in government, society, the world. Yes, of course, Judge Hand responded. We need to realize that most of the things that seem so new have been tried over and over again, and that they are very difficult. History, he continued, which is the only kind of education I value, teaches us skepticism as to the easy explanations that come to us. That has really been the purport of my song since I started testifying. If we are to get along, it will only be by the growth of skepticism. And skepticism may come from a sense of the past. A week earlier, Robert Jackson had testified. Same hearings. He's responding to questioning by Senator Hubert Humphrey, young Democrat of Minnesota. Jackson testifies, the great end, it seems to me, is to build in our public service a tradition of honor, which will be reflected in the reputation of public service. Countries such as England and Germany before the Nazis and the Scandinavian countries have been very successful in building up a civil service that has a high tradition of honor that is respected throughout the countries, rather more so than we have. It is a strange characteristic of all of us as humans, Jackson said, that we respect an obligation of honor sometimes more than we respect a legal obligation. I have known a great many men who would not mind violating some of the laws of the country about their conduct, but who would not think of doing such a thing as wearing tan shoes with a dress suit. <laughs> that just is not done, and they would not do it. But they might be willing to play the numbers game or do some other minor violations of laws. Continuing, Jackson said, if you can ever get a tradition in public service that there are obligations of honor, that there are things which you just do not do in the service, I think it is much more effective than absolute standards that can be imposed upon public servants. I think that perhaps a clear statement of standards would help towards that end, but it would not prevent defaults. Nothing will prevent occasional defaults. But it seems to me that the end of good conduct might be served very slowly by codification. There would be no spectacular results. If there is anything that our experience with the codification of ethical standards in the legal profession shows, it is that you cannot expect spectacular results from any effort of this kind. 
It is an educational effort and an effort of tradition that comes very slowly. But that is no reason why it should not be undertaken. And later, in closing, Jackson testified, I think if you can create a tradition of honor in the departments of government from the top down, you will do more than, than can be imposed by any code. Now, where does that leave us in terms of legacies? With apologies to Augustus Hand, he is a bit dropped out of the comparison I'm drawing. And to simplify it, maybe too much, there's a glass half empty and a glass half full that defines the two directions from which Learned Hand and Robert Jackson are approaching the problem. The problem of citizenry, the problem of law, the problem of judging, the problem of their life's work. Their greatness is that they give us each lives to emulate. And in doing so, in learning about them, they have a power, I think, to lift our own lives. There is a difference in temperament and outlook that I'm sketching here that comes forth so audibly in the hearings. Skepticism and pessimism on Learned Hand's side, pragmatism and optimism on Jackson's side. And I must say, after thinking about this quite a bit, I don't find them very different. These are matters of shading and degree. Each was a great judge. Maybe the hands, frankly, were a notch greater than Jackson in judicial workmanship. They, of course, did much more judging as a quantity, as their life's work, than Jackson did. He was many things, and 12 years of those were a judge. Maybe Gus Hand, in his modesty and in his less troubled disposition, was a notch greater than learned. But perhaps Jackson, in his breath, his vision, his humanity, his engagement not just with judicial work, but with all of law and life and people and the challenges of a moment, even the biggest ones, was the greatest. Thus, I'd like to close by endorsing and expanding upon some wise words. You've heard them before. I endorse these prescriptions, and not just for district judges. Quote learned. Follow Gus. But now I'd like to expand on it, because I think on top of that, or in the best of that, there are two other ideas. Quote Jackson. Follow Jackson. Because in his 1951 phrase, the public service is a tradition of honor. It was the hands, and it was Jackson's. It is the history of this circuit and this district. It will be advanced by the work in this majestic building later today and tomorrow, and long after any of us will be leaving footprints in Johnson Park or Ellicott Square or Niagara Square. And I am truly honored to be here with you to be your colleague as you advance by public service and educational effort that American tradition of honor. And thus, a phrase is the best way to close. Thank you, your honors. <laughs>
I was going to say Professor Dirt, but I really meant to say Justice Jackson. So thank you very much, and another round of applause. For you. Well, it's uh, it's my privilege to be able to wrap up this round of wonderful and auspicious proceedings before we step outside to the uh, reception. Um, I was excited and moved by the Hans lecture today, um, which knitted together all of the occasions that bring us together here. The Hans for which the lecture is named, the courthouse in this district, Justice Jackson with whom it will be named, and the very soil uh, of this square um, that he trod. Uh, I learned yesterday that uh, Justice Jackson was on the active rolls of this court until the move uh, into this building. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of surprising, but uh, it's less surprising today because in Professor ja uh, Barrett's care, uh, Justice Jackson remains a vivid personality and presence. Um, the professor's work is truly a, a stage in Robert Jackson's career. Um, and we're grateful to him for conjuring him up in this building where he will be commemorated. Uh, I'm hoping that you will remember us and this occasion uh, by, this, uh, by this book, The Remarkable Hands. Um, and I'm going to confer this on you now with great gratitude. The purposes for which we have gathered together having now been accomplished, let us adjourn to the celebration of the reception. Thank you all for your presence and your interest. <laughs>